So a big welcome to the ETH Game Programming Lab final presentations for 2022. It's great to see you all. We have a packed room. There's some people waiting to um, sit down. So if you're on the aisles, please move in and make room. That would be really um, appreciated so that we can accommodate everyone. Um, I also want to say a big hello to everyone watching the live stream. So hello wherever you are. Um, feel free to comment in the chat. We're watching the chat and we'll respond um, to any questions you have there. So we're here at the ETH, uh, at ETH Zurich, the Swiss, Swiss National Technical Institute. Um, the, uh, the Game Programming Lab is a, a course within the Computer Science Department at ETH. It's a capstone course that students take at the end of their uh, studies in computer science, where they apply the cumulative knowledge that they've learned during the computer science program to the group task of working in a team to create a novel video game pretty much from scratch. Um, so it's a really big undertaking. It's a, it's a huge triumph. And I'm very excited to see the um, presentations we have today. This year, the course was exceptionally large. We had 73 students divided into 13 teams, which means we have 13 amazing games to show you today. Now, we still wanted the course to feel intimate. So at the very beginning, on the first day, we sorted the students into three different houses. So I want to hear a big cheer from the House of Hyrule. <laughs> from the House of Stardew. as well as from the house of Azeroth. So wonderful, you see there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of energy here today. We also defined three different themes for the course, sand, sea, and snow, and we assigned each house one of the themes. So each of the games that you're gonna see are going to be kind of developed with the concept of this theme in mind. Now, um, Let's really get started. Um, we're going to see now each of the 13 games, a short presentation from each. We're going to go in house order, um, starting with the house of Hyrule. Please pay attention uh, if you're watching here in the room or if you're watching online, because you'll have a chance to vote for your favorite game uh, as soon as we finish the presentations. So I want to get started by inviting Hyrule Team 1 to the stage. Um, while they're coming up here, let's watch their teaser trailer. Hi everyone, we are really happy to show you our game Dust Off. It is a multiplayer battle arena party game, meaning you can casually sit together then fight each other to the bitter end in an arena full of tears, agony and despair. Think of something like Super Smash. Given the theme Sand, our core mechanic and catch resolves around it. So you have to, to free your genie, you have to um, acquire as much sand as possible and uh, and while, pretending, while preventing the others from doing the same. Um, you can do that by throwing spells in their faces and um, stealing their sand. So, all right, we will first um, talk a bit about our journey before um, getting into the details of the game itself. Yes, yeah, so during our break, uh, brainstorming sessions at the start of the project, we took inspiration from deserts, sandstorm, the Arabian Nights, Disney's Aladdin, and other sand properties. For Arena, we chose the Grand Palace of the Sultan. Our story begins with a sandstorm and players control magical genies. Sand is everywhere and can be thrown around. All these design decisions were implemented to create the dust-off experience. 
We have played many games and have seen many different kinds of game worlds, but we have never really created a game world um, from scratch. So how, um, how did we design a game world in which genies fight in an Arabic palace for their freedom? To answer this question, we gathered many sketches and ideas, and we concluded that we want to create a design and look that is simple, fun, and enjoyable. By using vibrant colors, uh, we made it look fun. By using a low poly style, we kept it simple. At the end, um, when we finished designing our arena, our mean looking uh, villainous sultan, and our genies looking s uh, round and soft, we were really pleased with the final look of our game. But now to our ga game mechanics. All right, so as mentioned before, sand is really the central resource in the game, and you can collect it from all over the floor. And you really want to get as much as possible. And uh, by collecting it, you really dust off the palace of the Sultan. Then uh, with the collected sand, you can cast spells to attack other genies, and th this allows you to steal some of their sand, and also it knocks them back, uh, giving you some more time to act. Then we also have some elements in our game. Uh, you can interact with them by either shooting through them, or you can touch them to buff your own genie. Water turns the sand into a mud ball, which slows the other genies if they're hit, and the fire turns the sand into dangerous glass shards that deal a lot more damage. With all this talking, our mouths are getting a bit dry and sandy, so I see you all yearning for more action, so let's head into some gameplay footage. A usual round takes about three minutes. You can see the timer on top. If you're quick enough and manage to collect all the sand before that, the round also ends. While development, uh, during development, we had some major challenges in tweaking the attack strength because, man, those glass shots were so OP. Um, now we're quite happy with every how everything turned out, especially the knockback has quite the humph to it. So we also took care of making sure the animations during sand collection were smooth and not too distracting from the actual gameplay. To conclude, overall, we learned a lot and had a great deal of fun. If you want to join in on the action, you can do so by checking out the following QR code. And join us later after the Apero uh, upstairs in Food Lab for a game playing session. On the QR code, you can also find uh, credits where we took our music from if you ever want to do an Arabic game yourself. So with that, we hope you enjoyed it. So big thank you to Hyrule Team One, Dustoff. We're going to move on now uh, to Hyrule Team Two, Eternal Sunsets. So come on stage and let's uh, watch your trailer. Welcome to Eternal Sunset, a game lab game by House Hyrule, where we had the theme sand. So we placed our game in the desert, and we also have an hourglass filled with sand, which I will explain in a bit. Uh, our game plays on a huge map. So basically what you do in the game is you explore different structures, you fight enemies, you loot items, 
And you do that until you're strong enough to uh, beat the game, the final end boss. <laughs> but there's a catch. You have an hourglass that is basically like a timer that uh, runs out after some time. And <laughs> when that happens, you will respawn at the same place you were before. So each time you gain some more information about the map and you have to optimize your runs so that you're strong enough for the final boss. And the world is infinite, we use procedural generation. We have, uh, we, we change the seat every week and there's a leaderboard. So you can compare each week uh, how good you are compared to your friends. Uh, our main inspirations were Cube World, Zelda Breath of the Wild and The Binding of Isaac. And here we can see what our game looks like. It is split screen with a third person camera. We can see both players inside the spawn area. Our world has four different biomes with varying difficulty. We have the desert, the savanna, the mesa, and the rock, de uh, rock desert. There are so seven different dungeon types. The dungeons are procedurally generated and contain strong enemies and amazing loot. This is the Sphinx dungeon. The loot chests are only accessible after solving up the puzzle inside. This is what we call the temple dungeon. It looks rather suspicious from the outside. Underneath it is a catacombs maze containing strong gear. You can find nine unique enemies. Not all of them are hostile towards the player. Some of them have sub-variants for the different biomes. There are over 70 items the player can collect. There are consumables, stat boosting, utility, and combat items. Uh, this is the Ring of Returnal. It creates a teleportation circle that returns you to a previous location. And here we have the Wand of Magic Missiles, which sends out three magic orbs that deal damage and return to the player. And finally, the, we have the hang glider and some mounts to make traveling through the world faster. And uh, there are four different weapons with three unique abilities and attacks to uh, encourage different play styles. So cool, um, let's now talk about the technical challenges that we faced during the development. So first of all is the chunk loading. So as you might know, uh, games with infinite worlds usually divide their worlds into small chunks. And in order to have better performance, we decided that we wanted this to be multi-threaded, which is of course hard because multi-threading is hard, but it works pretty well and all your cores will be used. You can see the state diagram on the right. Um, cool. And Next up is procedural generation. I mean, this is like a simple world generated using some algorithms. Um, it looks kind of boring though, so it's not very interesting, but we built a lot of structures in the sandbox game Minecraft, and then we made our own Minecraft mod to export those into like our game here. And then we built them using like an algorithm that we made to like place all the structures. Um, yeah, in total we have 185 structures. So now let's talk about the animations, as you can see. We built our own animation framework, um, which works pretty well, I think. Like, it naturally interpolates between different keyframes, and I think it looks kind of cool. Even on 120 FPS screens, it's kind of smooth. So, yeah, let's jump in, into some gameplay then, I guess. Here we see some raw gameplay footage. Um, yeah, so... The players will be exploring the world with um, their hang gliders. Uh, here we see them exploring a rock desert, for example. And um, now on the right side, we see one player will be using an active item to teleport back to his friends so they can join up for the end game. Uh, yeah, uh, and if you pay attention to the background, you can see that far away chunks are rendered in a low poly outline, and that is to preserve processing power. Um, and al also one of the biggest challenges in this game is the balancing, because there are so many items and abilities that um, changing one aspect of the game will always change some other aspect as well. When they think they have made enough preparations, they're gonna search and hopefully find the final boss room. As you can see, they're entering the final boss room where they fight the Basilisk. Here's a sneak peek of the Basilisk boss battle. It, is made to be, it was meticulously designed over a couple of weeks and it is designed to be a fun and engaging but still difficult uphill battle. Thanks for listening to our presentation.
So great job. Thanks a lot. We're going to move right ahead uh, to Hyrule Team 3, Seth Pyramal. Come on up and we'll show your trailer. Hi, welcome to Seth's Pyramal. Obviously, no controls were damaged in the making of that trailer. So, this is a game about you and a bunch of your alien friends who crash land into a pyramal and have to escape this rising tower, uh, this sand rising tower, uh, to get to the exit first. And we have items and other mechanics that will help you do that and reach the end victorious. So, but let's take a step back. So let's look at where we originally started. So at first, you see, uh, we tried to make a semi-cooperative play gameplay, and we wanted to have a cool sand simulation. And here you see early concept art. You see, like, two of the players are connected with a chain. So we first wanted to do something more cooperative, but then, in the end, we decided to make it purely highly competitive. <laughs> so... Uh, this is like a picture of our physical prototype. You see, most of the stuff that you saw in the trailer is already there. For example, platforms, you see like the falling sand. The contrast is a bit low, but you should see it. You have the sand on the bottom uh, and the items. And how it looked uh, in the playtesting phase, you see here. Boy, those guys look like they're having a lot of fun, right? Of course they are. So the story of our game is simple and not convoluted whatsoever. We have a bunch of aliens who you are a part of, and you're all going on an intergalactic shopping trip. But one of you messes up, the driver, and you start crash landing into the planet of destination, actually the actual mall of destination. But this is a very fancy, very prestigious intergalactic mall, and even emergencies like a spaceship crashing into it, making it being fall, filled up with sand, does not cease operations at all. It still will gladly do, engage with commerce with you and sell you items, so you can escape the sand and your inevitable doom with style. So let's talk about the main antagonist, the sand. So as you saw, <laughs> there was sand rising from the bottom, and the main is, uh, one of the main objectives is to escape the sand. And if you don't make it, you'll end up like this poor guy in the corner down here. <laughs> but you think you escaped the sand. You, you're you're well, well off. But no, you, you fought wrong. There's also sand falling from above, as you see here. But you can dash through the sand. But if you don't make it in time, it will drag you down to your inevitable doom, like said before. Now, sand is great and fun and you can do a lot of stuff with it, but to make the game more spicy, more fun, to encourage player interaction, we've included a bunch of items into the game. So let's go through some of those. Well, number one, you are a very adaptive alien space race, so, race, haha, um, so you can actually learn pretty quickly to manipulate the sand and use it as a nuisance against your foes, frenemies, friends, whatever you call them. You can freeze your friends right before they reach the exit, right to just get that extra little kick in the end. Uh, you can also harness the powerful teleportation technology to swap places with uh, your other foes to reach uh, to the very front before anyone else can. This is where the controllers get damaged, just saying. There's also the possibility to increase your jump height and reach places you thought you'd never reach with the wings. There's also a possibility to play with your frenemies and blah, 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 <laughs> and by fuck, fucking up their controls, so inverting them. And there's the most prestigious lead item, handcrafted sunglasses. They make you lead. There's a lot more about this game that we did not tell you in this presentation because don't, we don't want to take the surprise off uh, when you're actually playing it upstairs in the food lab. Thank you very much for listening. See you upstairs.
So thank you very much, um, Hyrule Team 3, really nice. We're going to move on now to Hyrule Team 4. Uh, the game is called Katrim. So come join me on the stage and uh, we'll watch your trailer. So welcome to our game, Katrin, which is about, yeah, you guessed it, cat. Uh, so our team was also sand, so we, we thought about what we could do with it, and we decided to do something fun where you could interact with the sand, because otherwise it's boring to have sand and not be able to do anything with it. So we started thinking, and we got this idea of having a cat that has special powers that allows him to person, attract sand, do stuff with that. And we, so that's the first prototype with it on paper to see whether it could be funny to do that. And obviously it's not very funny on paper, but it still gave us the idea of what to do. Then we got on to try to create fun level where you can do that. So the goal was to do a puzzle slash adventure slash 3D platformer game where you had uh, sand as a special puzzle mechanic. So we started with uh, basic stuff. It, then we got to sand part, so it looks a bit like a sand temple, and the story is basically um, you acted bad as a cat, you spilled your litter box, and you did nasty stuff, so uh, God came from above and punished you and uh, trapped you in the sand temple, and now you have to escape it. So that's the concept be, uh, behind the puzzle game, to try to go through those levels and find the exit. So here we see the first uh, level, how it looks like a bit, and now we're already later versions, so with sand, with the sky behind, with more items, etc. So it's really a progression we have here. We also did a lot of art for that, uh, that you'll see in the game. Uh, so that's the 2D art, 3D art. We did all that voxel style because we, we thought it added a touch to the game and it also wasn't too hard to work with. So uh, we had some fun technical challenges. I'll let. So in fact, uh, we had uh, two projects. We had the mono game project and a C++ project with a custom render that you can see on the left. So we tried to work on C++ with bullet physics and we make it work uh, in one way with a sand simulation that is our code. And so the big challenge was just to sort of stick all the parts together because it was not so easy to debug in the C-sharp when we had a problem or this kind of stuff. And also we had to find ways to make things efficient, efficiently uh, working, which was not so obvious. So you can see here the diagram with uh, bullet physics and our simulation that are, in fact, we got so all the data for the game to work on, uh, on mono game. And I think I can let the mic to Jayu. And uh, Magical Voxel is a very powerful tool that we used as both the modeling uh, software and the level editor. Because uh, we use it to model all our 3D arts as we've shown before, and uh, such that they have a unified pixel style. And we also use it to design a level because our, the physical layouts of a level uh, actually compress of these big voxels. And then we import the OBJ files into our renderer and the physical layouts into our physics simulation engine to finally make a level. So here we should have some gameplay video that we'll show you. Oh, yeah.
So is there some tutorial level where you learn how to use the controls, how to obtain your powers, how to exit the levels, and yeah. I'll just let the images speak. So yeah, I will not spoil everything, so to see more, just come and play the game and vote for us. Thank you. So thanks so much, and uh, let's move on now to the last game from the House of Hyrule. This is Hyrule Team 5 against the Tide. So join me and uh, we'll play your trailer. Welcome to the final presentation of Against the Tide. Let's start at the beginning. After hearing about this year's topic for House Hyrule, we had the idea of making a round-based strategy game where the player needs to protect the sandcastle from the waves. On the left side, you can see a first sketch that someone from our team made with their very impressive Photoshop skills. The idea, the idea was that the player builds some defenses against the waves, and as soon as they feel like the protection is good enough, um, they can call the next wave. The goal was that the game is very relaxing and gives a calm experience to the player. However, we believe that there might be not a lot of variation in the gameplay if you only protect against the wave. So we, only, uh, we also wanted to add some evil enemies that are trying to destroy the call. Castle. Additionally, the idea was that the player doesn't build the structures directly, but he has to command the inhabitants of the castle to build it for him. Here you can see uh, some impressions from our physical prototype. The game is already a lot closer um, to what we, you have seen in the trailer, but instead of the seagull, we finally decided on an evil crab instead. Our initial idea was that the crab can perform exactly one action per round. However, during testing, we found that we needed a lot of walls to protect the king's quarter from the wave. This would, meet, uh, this would mean that the player needs to start with many more crabs and it might be overwhelming. So that's when we decided to make the switch to real time, meaning that the player can do as many actions as they want before the next wave arrives. So let's look at some advanced gameplay. The player has managed to build a nice looking castle. The crabs can be commanded to pick up washed ashore materials and repair or build structures. As we can see in the bottom left corner, the wave will soon approach. That's why the, bring, uh, the player brings the crabs to a protected spot. It seems an enemy has arrived at the beach. Luckily, we have just enough material to build a catapult because we had collected driftwood in the last round and the other required materials were already available. The player can choose to attack the crab directly or use uh, the crabs to repair the buildings that the crab, evil crab is trying to destroy. 
they can also choose to completely ignore the crap as it will just go away after one round. But if the player manages to defeat the evil crab, they gain another crab to build stuff. So the main uh, technical achievement was the water simulation and the interactions uh, with the buildings. So for the water simulation, we opened some hidden water valves at the waterfront that pushed the water forward into the map. Um, as our world is completely grid-based, we also use the grid cells for the water simulation. Each grid cell has a water height and computes the water height based on its neighboring cells. After some time, the valves close and the water begins to flow back. After each wave, a score is calculated for each building based on the water height of the grid cell on which the building stands. If the score is above a certain threshold, one damage is dealt to the building. And additionally, as a punishment for the player, crabs that are touched by the water are knocked out, so the players are encouraged to protect the crabs by either building walls and gates or by bringing them to safety in time. So here you can see an implementation of the water just on CPU. As you can see, it's really, really laggy. Um, so we also implemented it on GPU. But unfortunately, like the GPU version didn't work that well on the Mac. So we still had to use the CPU version for a, a Mac. But fortunately, it just runs really well on the Mac. We don't know why, but it just works. <laughs> Yeah, that being said, we would like to thank the Game Technology Center for this amazing lecture. It was a great experience and we learned a lot about developing a game from scratch. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you for those kind words. Um, actually, this completes the games from the House of Hyrule. So let's give them one last round of applause. Great job. We're moving on now to the House of Stardew, which has a different theme. Their theme is the sea. So let's see what they have to offer. Um, I'd like to invite the first team, Stardew Team 1, their game is Hybris, to join me on stage and uh, we'll watch their trailer. Okay, um, most of you probably already know um, City Builder games, um, but as the name suggests, cities are mostly built, but there is no destruction. And destruction is the most f uh, fun thing ever, so uh, we decided to change that. We took this personally and we wanted to fix this with our game. So um, let's imagine our standard city builder game. Perhaps some of you may know this city building game. And um, the player only builds the city, but the city never is destroyed. So um, we have the theme um, C, as you have heard before. So our proposed fix to fix this problem is the following. Um, this already looks a bit better, but um, we still can do better. Okay, let's look at this side by side. So, first this one, a bit boring, and now this one. So, in our opinion, our fix, our proposed idea is way more interesting. So, let's look at our game. <laughs> So on that note, welcome to Hybris. 
Um, the word hybris comes from ancient Greek, and that means um, excessive pride or dangerous overconfidence. Um, you're probably all familiar with the tale of Atlantis, an island whose naval power besieged um, Athens in times long past. And because of its warmongering and, of course, its hubris, um, Atlantis fell out of the gods' favor, which ultimately led to their downfall and submergence in the ocean. So inspired by this story, we created our game Hybris. It is a 3D city builder, where the player must employ finesse and strategy to expand their budding nation, all the while taking care not to draw the wrath of the gods upon themselves, and thereby succumbing to the same fate as the Atlanteans before them. So at the start of the game, your island will be procedurally generated, with different distribution of biomes and resources for each new game. You will have to start at the edge of the island with a single building, and you will expand towards the center of the island. The player needs to build bridges to overcome the moats to reach new and better resources. Here we see how the starting phase of the game may look like. You have one house, which you can see next to the sea there, and you can build roads to connect different buildings. Um, we here, for example, have a fishing hut and a berry farm to collect food, food, and we also have a forestry at the back, which collects wood. If you look closely, you can also see at the bridge in the, in the back um, of the image, and that will then allow you to cross to the next section where you can gather resources such as iron and stone. In our game, we have 30 different types of buildings which you can place. Um, you'll notice that they are all sort of modeled to have a bit of an ancient Greek feel to them, which is in keeping with the theme of our game. Um, you can build anything from wheat fields to windmills to from blacksmiths and iron mines. We also have bathhouses, pharmacies, universities, theatres, everything that will allow you to make your city a bit more complete. So the aim of the game is to overcome the moats and to reach the centre of the world and to build Poseidon's statue to honour the gods. However, on the journey to, to your success, you have to be very careful that you don't get too greedy. This is because of the gods. So during the game, you also have to keep an eye on them to make sure that they don't get too angry. So in the Wrath of the Gods panel here, you can see what the requests of the individual gods are. One example is Nereus. Nereus is the god of fishing, and he doesn't like it if you overfish the seas. So if more than a quarter of your food comes from fishing, that god will get angry and will vote against you in the next Council of the Gods. So if more than half of the gods are displeased, a storm will hit your island and your city will begin to flood. Um, during the storm, of course, there are also lightning bolts and these can hit your buildings and destroy them. Um, the flooded buildings will also no longer be able to produce any resources and they will remain that way until they are again above sea level. So if you want to recover from the floods, you will need to do your best to make sure that the gods don't get angry. You will need to reach the center of the islands and build a, a statue to honor the gods. So if you feel like you're up to this challenge and you can want to test your own city building skills, you're welcome to download the game on itch.io or afterwards join us after the upload to try it out yourselves. Thank you. So thanks very much to Hybris. Really nice work. We're going to move on to Stardew Team 2, Curse of the Abyss. Come on up. Hello everyone, so we are the, de the developers of Curse of the Abyss and um, in this presentation we'd like to briefly go over the core ideas of our game, uh, walk you through some of the development steps and finally finish off by showing you some gameplay footage. So as you could see by the trailer, 
Our game is a jump and run uh, two player co op platformer. And um, when we started designing this game, we didn't want to make a generic platformer game. We wanted to make it stand out, and so we were, we were thinking about ways to make it more unique. And one of the main ideas we had was to give the players uh, a different, to offer them a different experience, playing experience, depending on which of the characters they were playing. So if you're playing the diver in the water, for instance, um, then you're playing sort of the classical jump and run um, game, just like any Mario game, whereas if you're playing in the submarine, you have to play more of a supportive role where you control uh, these different um, functionalities of the submarine that assist the player uh, in the water. Another thing is that we wanted to focus on fast-paced gameplay, so we wanted to uh, give this sense of time pressure to the player so that they have to think and act quickly. And to do this, uh, we've implemented this mechanic with the oxygen. So on this screenshot on the top left, you can see like a small oxygen bar. And the task of the submarine player is to regularly replenish this oxygen level um, before it depletes and the diver suffocates while also having to worry about all the other functionalities of the submarine that they um, have to operate. Uh, lastly, as a technical achievement, we have implemented mazes in this game, and they are um, randomly generated with a graph-based algorithm, uh, like the one you can see here. So every time you play the game, it, you're going to be presented with a different kind of maze. When we started um, designing our game, we first started drawing how we envisioned the game. We started sketching um, different levels and mazes, and then we created a physical prototype, which you can play like a board game. And then we moved over to a um, level designer. We placed the blocks where we wanted them, and then we imported them into the game. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning is, of course, this is only a fraction of the development process. There's, of course, a lot of programming work to implement all the functionalities, like the physics engine and so on. So now we'll, um, and of course, uh, an important part is the art and animation. It's all hand drawn, and um, we decided to go for a retro style pixel art look. So we'll now jump right into the gameplay. So here you can see the underwater player and the submarine player. The submarine player uses the bombing station to destroy a rock, such that the diver can get the fish egg in green. The submarine uses the gun to destroy a hostile blowfish. On the top left, you can see the mentioned oxygen bar, which gradually declines as oxygen is running out. If the oxygen is empty, then the player dies. Here you can see a preview of our maze level, which is completely in the dark. The submarine has a lamp which enlightens a certain area. The maze is completely procedurally generated, which means every time you play the game, you get a unique new maze to solve. As you can see, there are also enemies like blowfishes in the maze. The next is again a level in complete darkness. Here you can see a torch, which, when hit by the submarine's gun, enlightens a certain area. This is now a really tricky section with a lot of sharks. As you see, the player even got damaged by a shark. The submarine refilled just the uh, oxygen of the diver and now tries to hit the torch to enlighten yeah, <laughs> the area. <laughs> Lastly, we show you a section of our boss fight against the evil frogfish. In order to damage the frogfish, you have to hit its lantern with a bomb. After that, it turns red, and as long as it's red, you can damage the frogfish. The diver can also throw a dynamite to blow up the frogfish. That concludes our short game preview, and we hope to see you later at our booth, such that you can play the game yourself. <laughs> Thank you.
So, big thanks to Selfish. Oh, sorry, to uh, <laughs> Curse of the Abyss. However, next up is Selfish. This is Stardew Team 3. So, join me on stage. Excited to see your game. Sell fish, British guy, looking for, sushi buy, gather crew, ship out, to Mexico, without a doubt, dangers, no foresee, in the Caribbean Sea, get caught in a heavy storm, I can't take it anymore, we didn't start the fishing, it was always in motion, since there's salt in the ocean, shipwreck, battered, rebuild what was shattered, with the help of rods and nets, fishes are your main asset, as well, must defend, opposing any bad friend, pirates, out of the blue, octopus, drunken crew, we didn't start the fishing, it was always in motion, since there's salt in the ocean. We didn't start the fishing. No, we didn't invent it, but we tried to extend it. It was on a warm night in spring, and I was sitting on the shore of Kotzensee, determined to do some late night fishing. <laughs> The wind was blowing through my hair, and I was already dreaming of all the beautiful fish that I would catch that night. But suddenly, I heard someone approaching me. Hello there. <laughs> the person sat down next to me, and we talked for hours. We talked about fish and the beauty of catching them. And as you've probably already guessed, the person next to me were my five other brilliant team members. <laughs> Pascal, Chi, Mark, Marcus, and <laughs> Christopher. And I'm Robin. And then that person or those people asked me a question, a question that would change my life for the next three and a half months to come. Have you ever thought about creating a fishing game? And there was a passion, a fire ignited deep inside of me, and I was determined, determined to create the best strategic resource management fishing game ever. But what is the game actually about? <laughs> you're the captain of an 18th century fishing vessel, and your name is Dave. Your goal is to do some sushi trading in the Caribbean Sea. But your ship is caught in a heavy storm, and not only do you lose all your precious sushi, but also your masts are destroyed. So your new goal is rebuilding those masts to return your ship to its former glory. But storms are not the only dangerous thing that you'll encounter on your journey. Get ready for pirates, giant octopus, drunken sailors, and many other things. This is your ship. The goal of our game is to rebuild the masts. We have marked them in red. <laughs> During playtesting, we found out that we didn't actually explain what the goal of the game is, so many people were confused what you had to do. So we're going to remind you every 30 seconds. The goal of the game is to rebuild the masts. <laughs> but how do you actually rebuild your masts? Well, use fish. They swim in the water and we use them as resources. For example, there's the goldfish, which is currency. And also there's the fish finger, which is part of any healthy diet. And then we have the plankton, you know, like plank, wood. I think you got a pun. So the fish are resources, and you use those resources to build structures, like for example, this fishing rod, which catches the three basic types of fish that we just mentioned. But there's also other structures, like for example, the fisherman. Yes, it's a structure. Um, you place it next to fishing rods and other fishing structures to increase their effectiveness. There are even more structures like, for example, the fishing net, which catches different fish from the fishing rod. There are more structures to explore and you can check them out at their booth later. So your stuff becomes better and better until you are eventually able to rebuild your masts. But the fish are not the only thing that you have to manage. Uh, once you buy a structure, you have to place it on your ship's deck. And the structures come in different shapes and sizes. So you kind of have to play Tetris on your ship's deck and arrange the structures in such a way that they're as effective as possible. Another thing to keep your eyes on is the event timeline on top of the screen, which shows you what's about to happen between the fishing there are good and bad events. For example, here we have coming up a pirate attack, 
So you want to be prepared by having some cannons and walls and stuff because otherwise they may steal your fish. But there are also good events, like for example fish swarms passing by and then you want to have as many fishing structures as possible to really use the situation. So in any case you want to prepare for the events that are about to come. Okay, so uh, now for the next few seconds I really need you because we have a question. Um, the question is what is the goal of selfish? Who thinks it's A, survive as long as possible? Just raise your hand if you think so, okay. Um, who thinks it's B, kill all the pirates? Okay, do we have any C's? There is none. Okay, <laughs> that's an awful lot. And I think there are some people that already raised their hand at least twice. Um, and who's for D, rebuild the masts? Woo! <laughs> okay, I, I see you, you haven't really been paying attention because it's actually D. But anyway, um, come by later to play our game and then we may explain you the goal again if you didn't get it now. So, Okay, thank you for... <laughs> so big thank you to Selfish. Next up is the last uh, group from Stardew. This is Stardew Team 4 and their game Octodash. Hello and welcome everyone to our game Octodash, which is all about helping a cute little octopus to its feast. First, let's quickly introduce ourselves. Um, our team, as you can see, consisted of five developers. We had two artists, Nina and Gigi. We had two technical experts, ah, Nina and Chris, I'm sorry. We also had two technical experts, Felix and Gigi. And I myself took on the honorable role of being the producer and overseeing that we always deliver on time. When we started our journey of the game lab and obtained the topic C, we immediately thought of um, this fantastic creature, um, the octopus, which is which, with its squishiness, stretchiness, and wobbliness. But on top of that, we also find the idea very interesting of making the game cooperative in the sense that putting two players into one octopus, creating situations where the way to go is undecided yet and players have to figure it out. With this vision, we moved on to our physical prototype. We sat down one afternoon, took our leftover paper trash and tried to build a rudimentary level with a character and octopus consisting of chopsticks. What we learned during this afternoon is that our game has potential, but we also realized that prototyping with cardboard is not enough. That's why we moved on to um, development. Here you can see a first um, demo of our soft body of the octopus, which we spent many iterations on perfectioning it. The, especially the mesh on the octopus to get it squished and deformable took a lot of time, but for instance in this clip, the arms are not really satisfying since they still look like spaghetti. However, in the alpha version, which was, which was just two weeks ago, we already made huge improvement and this brings us to today's release, to the final version of our game, where we really appreciate if you check it out later after the after presentations. But of course, it's, with every game, there are also some bugs, and we don't want to keep them from you. Um, as said, the, the soft body was a lot of pain to get good, <laughs> and oh boy, did we have many of those bugs. But since this day is not about bugs, it's about our final game, on which we're very proud of, I'm um, proudly present to you um, the gameplay of Octodash.
That concludes our presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and we are very happy to welcome you later at our booth. Please go ahead. So thanks a lot to Octodash. Um, this is our last uh, game from Stardew. So again, a big round of applause for the house of Stardew. We're now moving on to the house of Azeroth. Their theme is snow. So let's see uh, what they have to show us. Um, we'll start with Azeroth uh, team one, and their title is First Snow. So please come on up. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. We're going to present our game called First Snow. So First Snow follows the journey of Mira, a little girl inside a snow globe castle. So we want to help her reach the top floor. And you can do this by moving the floor layers. So what does this mean? For example, you can move a layer down, we call it sink, or rotate a layer. So um, these functions will help you navigate through the castle and reach new places. So it's a bit like playing a Rubik's Cube with a player inside. As the game progresses, the castle will decrease in height and the map that's, that you can access will grow. So our idea was um, she inspired by two popular games, Monument Valley and Old Man's Journey. So both of these games involve modifying the player's environment to help reach some destination. So to match with the, um, the theme of our game, snow, we, we thought snow meant something magical and imaginations. So to match with this theme, we, um, we use pastel colors and low poly art style. The main puzzle itself was inspired by a game called The Room, but we just have a walking player instead of um, the ball rolling. And we first designed the puzzle on paper and built a cardboard prototype to test the playability of the puzzle. And the first release finally came to life. So aside from the main puzzle with the castle layers, we also have other riddles inside the rooms. And so after solving these, you'll be able to get a key to move the layer. And after many sleepless nights, that's the version we have today. So now we're going to show you um, the gameplay video. The giant teddy bear in the room actually contains clues to solve the riddles. Here we are trying to find the right boat with a hidden key. And we found it here. Using this key, we can, we can sink the second layer. Then the door is unlocked, and you can move on to the next level. Here again, you go to the teddy bear for some hints, and let's watch the process. There's a hidden ticket. It's the ticket to the Ferris wheel. You can also enter some rooms from outside. This is the final level here. So you rotate the, the castle and the door is unlocked. After you walk through, watch the magic happen.
All right, thank you for listening. This was our presentation. <laughs> and still, <laughs> be welcome to play, try out our game afterwards. Thank you. So thanks a lot to First Snow. Um, now we're going to move on uh, oh, to our next game, uh, which is called, uh, this is Azeroth Team 2. It's called Penguins. So come on up. Yes, hello. Um, imagine you've had a night out with a friend. Um, you come home, you, are, um, you don't want to go to bed just yet because it's not that late. The best thing you could do in this situation is to play a game that has you talking to each other, laughing with each other, maybe even arguing with each other. Just the kind of game that gets, you, um, that gets your heart beating and your brain thinking and puts you in a good mood. Introducing Penguins. It is a fast-paced multiplayer game that requires a lot of coordination and is time sensitive. And um, in this game, you and three of your friends are penguins that are stranded in the Arctic and um, in a place that is ruled by a gruesome and fearful snowman who periodically arrives to terrorize you and your friends. And um, the goal is that you can earn enough snowflakes in order to escape the snowman and fly away on a plane that you buy. Um, and um, the reason that snowflakes are the currency of this game is because whenever the snowman arrives, he, that's what he demands of you. And it's also the penguin's ticket to freedom. And the, re the way you can earn snowflakes is by um, getting a bunch of resources and trying to sell them. Resources can, however, only be gotten with the right tool and with, um, in teams. So for example, if you want to, um, if you want to get for fish, then you need to you need one player that hacks the ice and another player who gets the fish, or if you want to carry a log, then you need two players because it's too heavy for one penguin. And tr you can then trade your resources with the traders. Um, they always appear at different times and they never offer the same thing. That's what makes the game a bit more interesting. And you can also hide them um, in a mountain, but it takes three players to push the boulder to close the hole because, um, yeah, the boulder is very heavy. And hiding resources is important because whenever the snowman arrives, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't just take the snowflakes, he also steals all the resources that you haven't hidden. And I've already explained how you win the game. You need enough snowflakes in order to buy a plane and then you can fly away. So we wanted the game to be accessible to everyone, so you just need a laptop and four mobile phones. Then you can scan a QR code and you can steer your, phone, your penguin with your phone and have a good time. Um, I've already mentioned that this game is cooperative and requires a lot of communication and coordination. And this is a mood board of our origin story. Um, the name was inspired by a charismatic video of Benedict Cumberbatch trying to pronounce the name penguins, peng penguins and he said penglings instead. So because our players fly away in the end, we decided to name the game Penguins. And now Kaitan will show you some game footage highlights. The fuck was that? Yep, I'll show you. Yes, exactly, right there. So, bam. No. Okay. Yes, all right. No. <laughs> all right, so there is team play. As you can see, there is uh, the blue and the red penguin that are trying to hatch a lot together. And they're trying to push it together and they trade it with the traders. Also, there, is, there was the green and the red penguin who were trying to sell fish, which are they're doing right now. But the most important part of the gameplay is whenever the snowman comes, then the game becomes way more stressful because you have to provide enough snowflakes for the snowman to be happy. As you can see, the level of the sound is very high. And um, so now everything's all right because we have 17 snowflakes and only 10 snowflakes 
Okay, the snowman requires 10 snowflakes and we have 17, so we're gonna be good. The, snowf the snowman comes. We'll take your snowflakes and we'll take your items and you will have to continue evolving so that uh, you will manage to escape this evil snowman. This is a more advanced stage of the gameplay. As you can see, there is way more construction tools. Um, you have also sushi now, which is um, a power-up for the penguins so that they run faster. There is also a tool, sh like there, there's uh, multiple buildings. And afterwards, the goal, as you know, is to evolve uh, far enough that you can buy a plane right there. Here you can buy the plane for one plank and 28 snowflakes, which uh, they will, the team will do very soon. As you can see, there is the red penguin running with a plank right there, trying to buy the airplane in time. And whenever the, you can buy the airplane, then the whole team has to come to the plane, take it and f fly away from the evil snowman. And it requires a bit of coordination. As you will see, Red, I don't know what he's doing. He's just waddling around as a, as a penguin would do normally. And whenever he will get to the plane eventually, then the game will finish. And then well, thank you very much for listening to us. You can come play this game up top after. So, nice job, Penguins. Next, we're moving on to Azeroth Team 3. The game is Oops, I Left the Snow Generator On. So, let's see what they have. Hi everyone, uh, this is our game, Oops, I Left the Snowstorm Generator On, a play on words of like, oh, I left the oven on. Um, and our game is a survival adventure game. Uh, you play it as Guadalupe, and Guadalupe uh, needed to go to the supermarket, and they decided I'll turn on the heat before I leave, um, so the house is warm when I get back home, but they accidentally turned on their mad scientist uncle's snowstorm generator on, and so your goal is to get Guadalupe back home and to fix, your, fix this artificial snowstorm that you've made. And so the core mechanics of our game include uh, maintaining body heat. There's a UI in the bottom left corner that tells you how warm Guadalupe is, and you have to make sure Guadalupe doesn't freeze out in the snowstorm. Uh, you can gather resources, you can pick up sticks and stones like you see on the slide here, and then you can use those resources to craft tools. Um, what's unique about our survival adventure game is that you have a mobile base. As, uh, so you have this train, which um, you can use for storage, for warmth, and for crafting, and you can take it with you wherever you wanna go. And then lastly, uh, you can also play as other characters. As you go on your journey, you'll meet characters, and then once you befriend them, you can play as them, and each character has uh, specific skills and abilities that you can use to help Guadalupe get home. All right, so to complement this kind of casual gameplay, we thought it would be a good idea to have as much atmosphere in our game as possible. Um, to that end, we uh, started off with a system of like dynamic heat across the world. So you can place a campfire and it melts snow around itself. Even the train melts snow. And uh, this all factors into the gameplay, not just the visuals. Um, so you can't like venture out too far in the snow because you'll freeze as you saw in the trailer. Um, and we have a bunch of other cool technical feats to support that, like um, particle systems from scratch um, for like the snowflakes and uh, the fire, the flames, the smoke, the train even gives us smoke. Um, it's been a blast to make those. And um, oh yeah, the dynamically updating heat map. Um, we also have a collision system, just this seemed like a cool thing to show off. <laughs> 
and um, and triggers, of course, for picking up stuff and selecting like, a train. And we even made a level editor because um, for an adventure game, obviously, you want a lot of content and like a big level. Uh, so we wanted to make that as easy as possible. And um, yeah, I think we made a, did a good job there. So thanks for watching, and please come by later to try our game. So thanks very much to, oops, I left the snowstorm generator on. So the next game is Azeroth Team 4. The game is I See Runes. They have the honor of being the last game that we're presenting today. So very much looking forward to it. Let's uh, take a look at your trailer. Okay, so this is our game, I See Runes, and we are Noor, Oli, me, Yen, and also Matt, who unfortunately cannot be here today because he decided he'd rather sit on a sunny beach in France today. <laughs> so in this um, short presentation, we wanted to give you a sneak peek behind a couple of technical features from our games, starting with the procedural generation of the caves. So as you saw, the caves are um, procedurally generated, and we started out with an algorithm called binary space partitioning, which makes the dungeons look sort of like this. But later on, we switched to a more natural method called Perlin noise. Then finally, we also added some props like spider webs that um, slow the player down, rocks that obstruct the path and are destructible, and bonfires which serve as spawn points for the enemies. Now, Oli will um, tell you a little bit how we finished up the caves and polished them. So from the generation, we get a binary map with uh, walls and, and a ground. And how do we actually get this to look nice for a game? Um, the main task here is to distribute the right tiles for the right uh, walls. So the direction of the wall should be facing in that way if there is a ground on the, on the side and the corners and everything and everything. So how do we, do, uh, we did achieve that is by scanning the surroundings of each wall and pattern matching it to the correct tile. And as you see in the top right, uh, it, there's actually an enormous amount of, uh, of, of possible tiles that could appear. And since we are better programmers than designers, uh, we apply the post-processing step to the, to, the, to the caves to get rid of these cases. And now we have a final uh, cave that looks decent. And with some color tinting, uh, we can apply these, uh, we can apply some color tints uh, depending on the biomes to make these cool looking caves. Yeah. So, in our game, in order to cast spells, the player has to draw symbols on the ground. Let's say he drew this symbol. So what happens is that it is compared to different other symbols, each symbol corresponding to a different ability. And obviously here you see that the leftmost symbol is a match. So what happens is that the symbol activates, and in a specific case, it's activated a slowdown effect, which will slow down enemies. Uh, we can also draw a scissor-shaped symbol that will deal a lot of damage, fire arrows, uh, do area damage, or, and the most beloved ability is to heal, because the game is hard. <laughs> so now we'll show you a second trailer of the game, and you can appreciate the hardness again.
So it was IC Runes. We hope you enjoyed. And if you want to have more, join us at the our booth after the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's hear it once more for Azeroth. Great job, House of Azeroth. <laughs>
uh, we're going to validate the scores and find out um, who the audience award winner is. But while we do that, we're going to move on to the jury award winner. And here, it's a real honor to let you all know that we have, um, we're very lucky and fortunate to have the support of a game studio in Brighton and Hove in the south of the UK called Studio Gobo. So Studio Gobo is a triple A studio. They've worked on some really amazing titles, worked together with some of the biggest publishers in the world. And it's really um, an honor that they have taken the time to uh, try all of the games in the course, provide professional feedback, and ultimately select the jury award winner. So I want to give a special thanks to Nick Grover, who's the QA lead at Studio Gobo, who organized a playtesting session at their studio where each of the games was played by three or four different um, expert game designers from across their studio, from a, a, a range of different disciplines. Nick is joining us live now via Zoom. So, hello, oh, Nick. He's going to... Let's give him a round of applause. Hi there. Hi there. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thanks. Uh, so, Nick, good please uh, tell us your experience with the playtesting session, and we'd love to hear your uh, thoughts about the games and ultimately the jury award winner. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, inviting me along to the presentation. Um, this is, I think, the fourth year uh, I've been involved with organizing a team of volunteers at Gobo to playtest the titles that come out of this course. And without fail, every year, we're impressed with the, the overall quality uh, that the students produce. This year is absolutely no different. So here at Gobo, um, uh, as, uh, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, you know, we have a mix of people who've worked on dozens of games and people who are on their first project. All of them started out like the students on this course, uh, learning the skills that they've now carried into the world of professional game development. And this is what you, the students at ETH, are on the cusp of. You're the future of our industry. So the lessons that you've learned making these 13 games uh, are the knowledge you can now take into a career in game development, development should you so choose. Uh, so I hope by now uh, all the teams will have received a report with the feedback we put together for you. Very quick bit of uh, background on where the comments you've received came from. So in all, there were 20 people at Gobo uh, involved in providing feedback on your games from across the full range of different disciplines within the studio. So we had designers, artists, engineers, dev testers, producers. Each of those 20 people looked at two or three games and provided feedback that focused on the things they loved about the game, as well as the areas we thought would most benefit from a bit of further iteration. This is, in essence, the same process we go through with everything we make here at the studio as well. Because put simply, the best games will always be made by teams that not only enter into the process with a strong sense of collaboration, but who seek as much open and honest feedback as possible. I hope you find it useful. But as well as providing feedback, uh, we also had the important task of selecting a jury winner. So with a record 13 games to choose from this year, uh, unfortunately, there wasn't time for a panel to look at all of them and make a selection. So instead, uh, in addition to the feedback, everyone scored each game they looked at out of five. Taking the average of these scores reveals our winner. In fact, this is the same method we've used for determining the winner for the last couple of years. Only this year, something completely unprecedented happened. We have a tie. Uh, a tie not between two games or even between three. After everybody had looked at the 13 games you all made, written up their feedback and submitted scores, remarkably, we've ended up with a four-way tie. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we shouldn't be so surprised. It's a great <laughs> illustration of the high quality of games the students on this course produce. And let me add, while four games may have tied with the same score, the range of scores across all 13 games was very narrow. You all poured your hearts and souls into your projects, and it shows. But unfortunately, there isn't time to go through all 13 titles. So what Bob's asked me to do is to reveal our four jury winners and talk a little bit about each one. So without further ado, and in no particular order, our first winner is Stardew Team 2, Curse of the Abyss. Asymmetric. Uh, uh, asymmetric character, uh, given the two players very distinct, different roles was great. It, may, it means each player has total agency over the tasks they need to perform, knowing that the other player is depending on them. It's a co-op game where the players have to talk to each other. You also had a good range of threats and tasks that needed to be performed, giving plenty of variety to the players, along with some fun pixel art graphics, which we all like very much. 
couple of things to look at going forward would be the balancing between the two players, which currently seems to be uh, seems to give the submarine pilot a bit more to do at times, and potentially adding a checkpoint or save system so that dying doesn't feel quite so punishing. But lastly, we really appreciated the humor injected into the game. It's a great way to engage your audience. So, moving on to our second winner, Hyrule Team Three, Seth Spiramal. <laughs> there's a real, there's a real retro feel to this game with some couch competitive gameplay. The power-ups mix up the gameplay nicely, and the sand added some sort of floor is lava style tension, leaving the player holding their breath every time they fell off a platform. Being able to influence each other's games and block other players added another fun layer to the competition as well. Uh, there were a few bugs to iron out in the version we saw, which meant we weren't able to get past the second level, but would like to see more variation in level design and some more time put into the balancing of the power-ups. Currently, uh, the position swap uh, power-up, whilst really cool for the person who uses it, is a little overpowered, and it sort of disincentivizes people from trying to reach the exit if they know somebody else has already got that. Uh, overall, though, the game uh, was fun and addictive, leaving us wanting to play more. If you can get your players to feel that way, then you're onto something good. Right, our third winner is Azeroth Team 3, Oops, I Left the Snowstorm Generator on. We thought this was, uh, we thought this was a really charming game with intuitive survival and crafting uh, mechanics. Warm spots were signposted nicely in sensible and subtle ways. It all felt nicely atmospheric, like you were really stuck in a winter wonderland. We'd like to be able to move a bit faster. Uh, the walk speed is a, is a little slow, and there doesn't seem to be any reason you'd actually want to go that speed. Um, something we thought might add uh, another dimension to the player choice would be to have the current run speed as the default with a sprint option as well that, that could warm you up, uh, but at the cost of maybe stamina. Some combination of a mini-map, quest markers, and a quest log would be helpful too. Um, and then lastly, we love the train. Uh, using it as your hub for crafting and as a way of traversing larger distances felt like something we hadn't seen in games like this before. So we'd really like to see where you go next with the game. And our final winner, our final winner this evening is Hyrule Team 5 against the Tide. We thought that there was a lot about this game that really hit the right notes for a, a sort of fun strategy tower defense game. It was fun, the art style worked well, the hermit crabs were cute, and it was helpful that we could queue up tasks with them. And you implemented autosave, which is a super welcome feature in a game like this. Well, one of the things that we liked about the game was the relaxing beach vibe that it gave off. A tower defense game like this should probably make you feel a bit more imperiled. So once, once everything was built, it seemed uh, pretty easy to keep it maintained and counter any giant crab attacks. So some more balancing would probably be a benefit here with more enemies and more frequent waves. We'd like to see some iteration and polish on the UI as well, uh, as this is such an important area for a game like this. Uh, but overall, you blended all your features together nicely into something that we just wanted to keep playing. So yeah, congratulations. Congratulations to Azeroth Team 3, uh, Hyrule Team 3, uh, Hyrule Team 5, and Stardew Team 2. Uh, but also a big well done to all the teams for the standard of the games you put out. There are some really impressive ideas and technical achievements here, and you should all feel very rightly proud of what you've done. All that's left is for me to say from everybody here at Gobo, good luck to you all with whatever you do next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. So thank you so much, Nick. Wonderful. We really appreciate it. And uh, amazing we have four jury award winners. Uh, that's definitely first ever for the Game Lab. So moving on, um, we actually have just uh, one more order of business, and that is the Audience Award. I want to ask uh, Fabio Tsund if we have a valid result. Ah, he's telling me yes. So could you please <laughs> hand me? I have no idea what's inside. Thank you very much. So this is our last award, the Audience Award. Uh, let me take it out and see what we have here. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's wonderful. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to announce two runners-up 
and then the audience award, because the scores are very, very close, okay? So it's very hard to, to uh, find the right uh, answer. So the uh, second runner-up for the audience award is Azeroth Team 2, Penguins. So <laughs> congratulations. The first runner-up is Stardew Team 3, Selfish. Congratulations. <laughs> and the Audience Award winner is Stardew Team 2, Curse of the Abyss. Again, congratulations. So, I want to finally give a huge thank you to Gobo again for their expert mentorship. I want to thank the Game Lab team who has done a fantastic job. They're managing the live stream. They were helping with the course. So really fantastic, uh, wonderful job there. Um, a big thank you to the audience. So everyone here watching us uh, live as well as on the live stream. But most of all, a big thank you to all of our fantastic students who really did the work this semester to make these amazing games. You're all winners. So big congratulations. <laughs> That concludes the event. Um, if you're here in person, you can exit, turn left, and go upstairs. We have an opera set up along with a vernissage, so you can enjoy a drink, a snack, and play all of the games. Thanks a lot. See you next year.